Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Well, as I was listening to that part of Ed and Jan's story, uh, it's great fun to hear and to realize, um, if you notice the dates, but they put 24 years into their, of their lives into translating the New Testament in that one language in Indonesia. But as they've done that, it dawned on me that what we are going to look at today in our language um, was translated by someone. You know, God's Word didn't come to us in English. It came to us in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and all that. And... Um, Someone had to put in the time so we can read it today. And so just as that has happened for us, we are now as a church involved in Imagine Zero, uh, making sure that we can do our part to make sh- th- that so that others can read God's Word as well. So that's what the panels on the, on the lobby are about. So I hope you'll get involved there. Well, most of you know I'm a sports guy, uh, that I played a little basketball back in the day. And so I'm a big March Madness fan. I uh, love to watch the games. And last night there was a great game. Moment of silence for Purdue. In fact, I kind of heard it was a great game because I have have this annoying habit of falling asleep at about 9.30. And so I missed like the last 10 minutes of a great game. But I learned about it this morning. It sounded like it was a really good game. But if you're paying all attention to the tournament, you know that the number one seed overall, the the, the favorite to win the whole thing uh, is Duke University. How many Duke fans are here? How many hope Duke loses today? (laughs) Same thing happened in the previous service. They're like the death star of college basketball or something. Well, if you're paying attention, you know that Duke's star player, one of their star players, is an 18-year-old freshman phenomenon named Zion Williamson. Now, Zion Williamson is six feet, seven inches tall. Uh, He weighs 285 pounds, and he has a vertical leap of well over 40 inches. That's not Photoshop, by the way. He can actually do that. Um... He was born in North Carolina, raised most of his life in South Carolina by a single mom. Uh, He received his first full scholarship offer when he was 14 years old, a freshman in high school. At that time, he was sort of more normal size, six foot three, about 175 pounds. But over the next two years, by his own testimony, in two years in high school, he grew four inches and gained 100 pounds in two years. And he said he got faster. Wouldn't that be a nice thing? You gain 100 pounds in two years, and you're a better athlete than you were before. But that's what happened for him. I wondered if either he or his mom have ever come across Isaiah chapter 52. Take a look at this on the screen. Awake, awake, Zion. Clothe yourself with strength. It's actually not the point of that verse, but I thought it was kind of fun to put it up there for you. The truth is college coaches are recruiting and scouting younger and younger athletes, way down even into fifth and sixth graders, And they do this because they're all looking for the next big thing. They're all looking for the next Michael Jordan. They're all looking for the next LeBron James. Uh, They're in the predicting business. One could say the prophetic business. They watch 13 and 14-year-old athletes and try to predict or prophesy what they're going to look like when they're 19 or 20. And coaches who can do this well wind up winning championships and getting paid millions of dollars. Coaches who do not do it well end up getting fired. So let's say coach sees young Zion Williamson as a ninth grader, six foot three, 175 pounds. And that coach goes, you know, I think in two years, this kid's going to be like six, seven and 285 pounds. We think he's pretty good at the predicting thing. If that same coach said, well, in four years, I think he's going to be the number one pick in the NBA draft and become an instant multimillionaire. We'd say he's really good at the predicting thing. But let's say it's not a coach at all who says these things. Let's say it's a, let's say a monk living in medieval Europe, 13th century, seven centuries before Zion Williamson is even born, six centuries before basketball is invented, four centuries before America is even a thing. And that monk predicts accurately the birthplace of a surpassing athletic talent, how tall he'll be, how heavy he'll be, where he's going to go to university. That would be amazing, right? That's what we have in ancient prophecy in the Bible. We're in a series now called Jesus and the Prophets. And for the last four weeks, we've been looking at The ancient prophecies of men like Micah and Hosea and Zechariah as they they look forward to and sort of predict the coming of God's Messiah, the anointed one. And we've seen along the way, they said, he will be born in Bethlehem. He will be both king and shepherd. Uh, He will love his wayward people like a husband loves 
a wife who's been unfaithful. He will be called titles like wonderful God, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. All these things we've seen already. And today we're going to look at the prophecies of Isaiah, specifically in chapter 53. One of the clearest places in the entire Old Testament that we as Christians think are pointing toward the coming of Jesus into the world. Up to this point in Isaiah 53, or in Isaiah's prophecies, I should say, prior to Isaiah 53, Isaiah has been telling us several things. He's been saying that one is coming, uh, the promised one is coming, not only to redeem Israel, but that the Messiah will make Israel a light to the Gentile world. And that was kind of surprising to the ancient Jews. Also, he will come not only as a conquering king, but Isaiah begins to suggest the Messiah will come as a servant, even a suffering servant. So I'm going to read from you, for you uh, the first few verses of Isaiah 53. Isaiah writes, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? We pause there. The arm of the Lord is a phrase that just refers to the strength and power of God. He's saying that God is going to reveal his power and strength in a surprising way, that many are going to struggle to believe. Who will believe our message? Verse 2, He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. So the first thing... I want to suggest that Isaiah is telling us is that the coming Messiah will be the unexpected one. He'll be unexpected. Uh, as a pastor, as you know, I, or could guess, I do lots of weddings. So I've heard lots of different stories about how people um, found each other and fell in love. I've heard lots of love stories. I heard one just the past week when I interviewed a couple who was getting ready to get married. But about 10 or 12 years ago, I started hearing another kind of story that was different. I started hearing stories that people who found each other over the internet, uh, through uh, online dating sites. Um, you've heard of them, Match.com, eHarmony, Christian Mingle. There's even one called FarmersOnly.com. And that one makes me smile, because I, I, I've never been on one of these sites, but I can imagine how they work. You, know, you post a profile, then you, kind of, you sort of get in touch with someone, emailing. I can imagine, you know, you're going farmersonly.com and you type in, hi, I'm so-and-so. Do you like corn? <laughs> Person types back, well, yes, yes, I do. Do you like tractors? Yes, I do. John Deere? Yes. <laughs> if you're a farmer, I, I, I apologize. <laughs> it's estimated today that one in five relationships, 20% start like that online. And in a few years, 2040, they're guessing that up to 70% of all marriages will start on an online dating service. Now, if you're younger here, you're, you're in great middle school, high school, you know, that, 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 there's a 70% likelihood that's how you're going to meet someone. Now, I've heard some really sweet stories like this, but I want to give you a little bit of a heads up because I've heard, also heard some sort of train wreck stories about meeting online. And they usually have to do with the people, human tendency to sort of misrepresent ourselves if we can. Uh, the Pew Research Center has found that as many 20% of people who use those sites lie about themselves in one way or another. In particular, they tend to do it with their physical appearance. For example, they post photos of their younger selves. Or they even post photos of other people and say, that's, that's me. Now, let's think about that just for a second. The way these things work, I think, is that you post a profile, you have a photo, maybe of your younger self, maybe of a different self. Uh, and then eventually, you're successful making contact, so you get together for real, and you have like coffee, and you walk in the, and you go, whoa. <laughs> what happens if Mr. Right turns out to be someone else, or Mr. Wrong? Well, disappointment, right? And even rejection. And I think that's what Isaiah is hinting at here in Isaiah 53, I could, because we can do the same thing in a way with Jesus. For example, how many of you grew up with this picture in your house? Anybody seen that before? We had, we had that exact portrait in our home uh, that was painted by an artist named Warner Salmon in 1940. It's been reproduced over 500 million times. I call it Swedish Jesus. 
Looks a little like eh, a little Bjorn Borg in him there. Uh, or maybe you're more familiar with depictions of Jesus where he looks more like a rock star. This one's kind of popular today. Reminds me a little bit of one of the BGs. <laughs> I know some of you remember the BGs from the good old days. A few years ago, a forensic anthropologist created this image of a typical Jewish man, what he might have looked like in the first century. For how many of you does that match with what you imagine Jesus to look like? And on top of that, we know the average height of a Jewish man in the first century was five feet, four inches. How are you with that? My brother, who's a pastor in Ohio, once did a whole sermon series called Getting to Know the Real Jesus, and his subtitle, I love this, was, I thought you'd be taller, he said. (laughs) See, one of the interesting things about the New Testament is that while it tells us a great deal about what Jesus said, a great deal about things he did, a great deal about who he was, it tells us nothing about his physical appearance, what he looked like. Isaiah says, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Now, right about now, the the ancient people who first read or heard this prophecy would be going, whoa, 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 time out, time out, wait a second. Because they had certain expectations of the promised Messiah. They expected a king like King David or King Saul. They expected Messiah to look like a king. In 1 Samuel 9, we're told that King Saul, the first king of Israel, was the most handsome man in all of Israel. And he was a head taller than everyone else. Tall and handsome. That's the expectation. 1 Samuel 16 tells us that David was the picture of physical health. It was also handsome in appearance. So it was natural for the ancient Jewish people to expect their Messiah, their promised one, the anointed one of God, to look like a king and to live like a king, to be surrounded by wealth and palaces. They expected their Messiah to be a warrior like King David after David killed Goliath and became a hero. The Bible tells us that the women lined the streets and sang songs to him. Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain his ten thousands. He was their warrior king who would defeat all their enemies and would restore Israel to glory again. So when the prophet says he had no beauty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him, the people would have been confused. Like, who who, who are you talking about? So why do we think this ancient prophecy points not only to Messiah, but to the one we call Jesus. Let me read this next passage to you. Excuse me. Verse 2. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. Now, what's that mean? Well, it means something grew where you didn't expect it to grow. Something good came out of a place where you would not expect it. Now, we know Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which was called the city of David, which would have made sense out of the line of David, king. But we also know Jesus grew up most of his early life in Nazareth, in the north, in Galilee. And that was surprising because Nazareth was seen as a backwater town, like out in the sticks, unimportant. Who would ever come from there? That's what the prophet is saying. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. When Jesus began his public ministry, and he actually proclaimed himself to be the fulfillment of prophecy, people all said, what? This is just a carpenter's son. He's just an ordinary guy. What's he talking about? He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Despised, rejected, familiar with pain. We're going to talk more about this in just a few minutes. But from what we know in the New Testament of Jesus' arrest, his interrogation, his eventual crucifixion, he fits the prophetic picture of what Messiah would be. Jesus was not what people expected in a Messiah. He didn't come with a political agenda. He didn't come preaching the overthrow of Rome. He came preaching, pray for your enemies. He didn't come clothed in wealth and position. He was a carpenter's son, a man of sorrows, Isaiah says, acquainted with grief. Certainly not what was expected, and so he was rejected despised, one from whom men hide their faces. And in some ways, that happens to Jesus still today. 
In some ways, maybe we can do that. We want Jesus to fit our expectations. We want him to agree with our politics. We want him to provide us with, a, with the right job, with the right standard of living, to protect us from all the bad things in the world, to help us make the team in middle school, to help us get good grades, to help us get into the right college so we can be successful. And if he doesn't meet our expectations, we can be a little disappointed with him. Isaiah says the Messiah will be the unexpected one. And then the second thing he tells us here is that he will also be the suffering one. The suffering one. A couple years ago, I saw an interview uh, with Ed Catmull. You may not recognize the name, but uh, he's the former president and chief creative officer at Pixar, sort of the producing mind behind movies like The Incredibles, Finding Nemo, Toy Story. By the way, did you see there's a new Toy Story coming out this summer? Toy Story 4. I don't know about you, but I love that, those stories. I'm excited about that. Bonus question. Do you know when the first Toy Story came out? What year? 1995. Some of you weren't even born in 1995. Wow. But in this interview, Mr. Catmull was asked, why do you give your life to this? Why do you make animated movies? And he said, I believe stories change the world. I do it because I believe stories change the world. And I think he's right, or at least partly right, because stories matter. Stories are powerful. You're living a story right now. Your life is a story. My life is a story. But there's only one story that changes the world. Think of the stories that we love, the stories that move us, the stories that inspire us. Aren't they often stories of sacrificial love? Stories like Lion King. One of our favorites. By the way, a new version of that coming out too. We love the story of Lion King. Mufasa the king gives his life to save his son Simba from the stampeding herd of wildebeests, right? Saving Private Ryan, one of my favorites. Tom Hanks' character, Captain John Miller, has orders to find a soldier who's already lost, lost three brothers in the war. You just have to find him, bring him home safely. And Captain Miller accomplishes that mission but gives his life in the process. Sacrificial love. I don't know if you noticed this, but... The president just this week gave the Medal of Honor, our highest national honor, to posthumously to a soldier, uh, an Army Staff Sergeant named Travis Atkins, who 12 years ago in Iraq had his patrol engaged by an enemy wearing a suicide vest packed with grenades. And this sergeant uh, realized that the enemy had pulled the pin on this, his own suicide grenade, suicide vest, and so Travis jumped out of the vehicle, tackled the man to the ground, and laid on top of him intentionally until it blew up, killing him instantly but saving his whole troop. Medal of Honor. Sacrificial love. That's the story that changes the world. We see it here, verse 4. Surely, Isaiah says, he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds, we are healed. We are all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the, of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now here is the message the prophet says no one wants to hear. The Messiah, the promised one, the king, the shepherd, the redeemer is going to suffer and die, Isaiah says. Like a lamb led to the slaughter. Now, the people of Israel in ancient times were very familiar with the idea of a sacrificial lamb because a lamb had to be slaughtered, its blood spilled to atone for the sins of the people. That was the ancient sacrificial system. Isaiah is saying the time is coming when Messiah will come and Messiah, your king, will be in himself the sacrificial lamb. Now, all this should make us ask three questions. Maybe you have them going on in your head right now. First, why do we think this prophecy, written 700 years before he was born, is about Jesus? 
Secondly, why was it necessary for Jesus to suffer? And third, how do his wounds bring our healing? First question, why do we think this is about Jesus? Let me just go through these quickly. Isaiah says the Messiah will be bruised. We know Jesus was beaten, and he was also flogged with the Roman whip before his execution. Isaiah says he'll be pierced. Jesus, of course, had nails driven through his hands and feet and a spear thrust through his side. Isaiah says he'll be rejected and despised. We're told in the New Testament that as Jesus died on the Roman cross, people laughed at him and mocked him. Can you imagine? Isaiah says he will be assigned a grave with the wicked. We know Jesus died between two criminals who were condemned with him. It says he was with the rich in his death. Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb. So at least eight specific prophetic comments in these first 10 verses of Isaiah 53, all of which we see clearly in the life of Jesus. Second question, why was it necessary for Jesus to suffer? I know many people struggle with this whole idea of substitutionary death. It just seems so barbaric. Why not just teach us that God loves everybody and we should love each other? Why not just leave it at that? Why the cross? Well, part of that struggle is because we no longer understand the nature and devastation of sin itself. Just last year, right here in the local area in West Chicago, I think it was, police found the body of an 18-year-old young man who had been stabbed multiple times, set on fire, and run over by a vehicle multiple times, murdered by other teenagers. And we, we, we hear a horrific story like that. If we pay attention, we hear them every day. We see a horrific story and we think, that's just so wrong. It's evil. Someone's got to pay for that. What kind of God would it be? If there is a God who exists, what kind of God would not be interested in justice? What kind of God would not punish such evil? Everything in us cries out for justice. But the truth is, we want more than justice. Just two weeks ago, I was driving home from a long trip by myself, and I was tired, and I, I just wanted to get home, and I, and I was in a hurry, and I was made the last little part of the trip driving through my neighborhood just to get home, in my neighborhood. And I was so, like, not paying attention, I didn't even notice the police officer pull out and start following me through the neighborhood. Just followed me all the way through my neighborhood, right, right behind me, I didn't even notice. I zip into my driveway, park my car, look at my rearview mirror, and he's right behind me in my driveway. I'm thinking, oh, how fast was I going? What was I doing? I'm tired. And he comes to my window. He looks at me, and he almost burst out laughing. I think I made his day because I think he assumed he was following, uh, I don't mean to be offensive, but a teenage driver. I think he thought he was following some young guy just driving like a maniac, and it made him laugh to see how old I was. He would look at me and he goes, what were you doing? And see, at that moment, I wanted mercy, not justice, right? <laughs> I didn't want justice right then. And he, he, he eventually didn't, didn't even give me a warning. I think he just made his day. He, he said, just don't do, stop, don't do that anymore. See, we, don't, we want justice when it's someone else. When it's my failure, I want mercy. I need mercy. So which is it going to be? What's the Messiah going to bring, justice or mercy? Isaiah says he's going to bring both. Both justice and mercy. See, the cross of Jesus is where God's justice and God's mercy meet. Justice says sin destroys. It must be paid for. Mercy says Jesus paid the entire price justice, and mercy. Third question, how do his wounds bring us healing? When Isaiah says, by his wounds we are healed, he's assuming that we also have wounds. Why else would he say the word healing? By his wounds we are healed. We are wounded. You are wounded. Even as you sit here today, I'm wounded. We do a pretty good job of concealing our wounds, sort of hiding them from each other, especially here on Sunday morning. We hide them. But we're all wounded We carry them around with us. Some of our wounds are self-inflicted. That is, we do and say things that, that hurt 
people even that we love that destroy relationships. We sabotage our own lives by our own selfishness and our behavior. That's called sin. Isaiah says, he was pierced for our transgressions. The Lord laid on him our iniquity. The meaning is, like a sacrificial lamb, Messiah will take our sins, bear them in himself, and carry them away. But some of our wounds are not self-inflicted. Some of our wounds are undeserved. They come not on the basis of what we've done, but on the basis of what someone else has done. The world inflicts wounds. People sometimes, see, we're sinners. We sin, I sin, but we're also sinned against. What then? How are those wounds healed? Isaiah says, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. See, Jesus came not only to forgive you, but to heal. Not just to forgive your wrongs and your sin, but to bear your pain. He knows what it is to be rejected. He knows what it is to be despised. He knows what it is to be abandoned by his friends. He knows what it is to have untruths, rumors passed around about him. In his suffering, there is healing for your pain. He is willing to carry it and bear it for you. Now, what about physical healing? I leave this for last because we often think of it first. Because we in our culture here in the first world tend to treat physical health as the most important thing in life. But if we are created for an eternal relationship with God, that's just not true. While physical life is important and our health does matter, it's not the most important thing. And yet, Jesus is the healer. He did heal. He does heal. But he healed in New Testament to demonstrate his authority to give us a deeper healing, the healing for our souls. Because the ultimate healing he offers is the promise of eternal life. Isaiah says the Messiah is not only unexpected, not only the suffering one, he is also the living one. And that's the third thing today. Isaiah 53, verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. So why do we think this part points to Jesus? Isaiah has already said Messiah will suffer. We know that Jesus suffered. He's already said that Messiah will suffer sacrificially. We know that Jesus died as the final sacrifice for the sins of the world. But notice it says he will see his offspring and prolong his days. He will see the light of life. He will be satisfied. This, we believe as Christians, are point, is pointing us to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, obviously, we're going to get there in a few weeks when we celebrate Easter weekend. But why does it matter that this is added into the prophecy? The problem of sin, my sin's been taken care of. He bears it. The problem of my pain has been taken care of. He bears it. But there's another problem. And the problem is called death. Death is universal. The Bible calls death the final enemy. But the prophet's reminding us that death is not the end of the story. Jesus isn't just another tragic hero like Mufasa or Captain Miller or Travis Atkins because his story ends not with death but with life. Paul says in Romans chapter 4, he, Jesus, was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life. Raised to life for our justification. Paul's saying that the story of Jesus ends not with death, but with resurrection life. And without this last promise, that the suffering one is also the living one, Jesus' death is just another death. Heroic, maybe inspiring, but doesn't really change anything. But if the suffering one is the living one, that changes everything because it means he has all the resources necessary to pay my debt. It means he has all the capacity necessary to bear my pain. It means he has all the power necessary to defeat death itself. In the past less than a year, uh, eight, ten months, I've shared in a number of funerals, both 
inside our church family and outside, just as Jeff has and Sterling and all of us. Um, but two kind of stand out. One was last summer, oldest person in, uh, that I remembered, and this, this fellow was 99 and a half years old exactly. The youngest, I mentioned the story last week, um, little boy died in his mother's womb at 35 weeks. So from an earthly human perspective, so different. One, a long, rich, full life, 90, almost a century, 99 and a half years. The other one never even got started. But from an eternal perspective, they're the same story from the eternal perspective. Now, we don't know when our earthly journey ends. None of us know when our lives are going to end, our earthly lives. But we can all know how our story ends because we know how his story ends. Not in fear, sadness, and death, but in hope and joy and glorious life. That's the word of the prophet. Would you bow with me as I close today? Lord, we do thank you today for your word, for the words of promise and hope that come to us through the ancient prophets. Thank you for fulfilling every promise made, for bearing our sin, for bearing our pain, for healing our wounds. And most of all, we thank you for the great promise of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.